Okay, so welcome back. Uh, yesterday we dealt with uh, the microstructure of bainite, many detailed aspects about the microstructure, and we also talked about the atomic mechanisms by which bainite forms, and we considered those mechanisms in terms of all the other phases that form in steel, because it's important to put bainite in the context of all the other phases. So today we are going to, uh, the first part of uh, my lecture will deal with mechanical properties, which is very important of course, and how the mechanical properties relate to everything that we learned yesterday. And then the final part will deal with uh, uh, a new kind of a microstructure, which some people call super bainite. Okay. Now, there are many kinds of bainitic steels, and I'll just very quickly summarize those steels for you. Um, you are very familiar with accelerated cool steels, which basically are low carbon bainitic steels, and you use the high cooling rate to produce the microstructure instead of using lots of alloying elements to produce the microstructure. And in doing that, you can produce bainite in very thick sections, you know, for example, for shipbuilding and so on, using very few alloying elements and having good weldability. Uh, then you have forging alloys. And the big advantage of bainite in forging alloys is that you don't have to do any heat treatments. There's no quenching and tempering. You can produce the right microstructure during just the cooling part of the cycle. Uh, there are various kinds of medium strength uh, uh, bainitic alloys which are used for crash reinforcement in cars, for example. Um, these high strength, you know, up to 1600 megapascals are being used in railway lines and I will give you an example of that. And this is the part which I will deal with in the second uh, component of the lectures today, which hasn't got many applications yet, but it looks very exciting. If I now uh, go on, these are all steels which are cast and then rolled and deformed and so on. But there's a large number of cast alloys which are used widely. So for example, the austempered ductile cast iron has a matrix which is bainitic ferrite and retained austenite. Okay. Uh, they have very good uh, ductility compared with normal cast irons. There's many welding alloys which rely on bainite. Almost all the power stations which were built uh, more than 10 years ago contain bainitic steels, the two and a quarter chrome, one molybdenum type bainitic steels which resist creep. And then we have this uh, uh, Nippon steel alloy in which you deliberately add particles to nucleate bainite on the particles and therefore produce a better toughness because the plates of bainite then point in many different directions. So the potential for bainitic steels, and already many of them are used, is huge. And we'll begin by looking at what contributes to strength in the microstructure. Okay, so we're just looking at the yield strength, the tensile strength. And then I'll go on to talk about uh, ductility, toughness, and so forth. So we can imagine the strength to consist of several components. First of all, supposing we had absolutely pure iron with nothing in the microstructure, so that would be just a crystal structure, they, it would still have some strength. So this is the strength of pure iron without any microstructure. We then have uh, solid solution strengthening components, and those components vary with temperature. So the amount of solid solution strengthening that you get depends on temperature. And the behavior of substitutional solutes is different from that of carbon. So carbon has a different strengthening effect than substitutional solutes, and we will see why. The grain size of bainite is not like the normal grain size. We have plates, so it doesn't quite obey the whole patch equation. The strength varies with one upon the thickness of the plates, and we will see why. You can have precipitation hardening, for example, in the creep-resistant steels, and of course, there's a dislocation density, which is created by the plastic accommodation of the shape change, which also contributes to the strength. So let's have a look at all those components uh, one by one. Here, what I've done is I've calculated all those components for a martensitic steel, which is simply quenched, not tempered. 
When you do that, uh, so this is uh, about 0.4 weight percent carbon, most of the strength of a martensitic steel comes from carbon in solid solution because the carbon sits in octahedral sites which are not regular octahedra, they cause a tetragonal strain. And a tetragonal strain is very powerful in interacting with both the shear and the dilatational components of a dislocation. So carbon in ferrite causes huge hardening. This component will be more or less absent in the case of bainite because the carbon is either precipitated as cementite or it is partitioned into the austenite. So we cannot rely on this to produce a great deal of strength in bainite. Uh, in ordinary steels, the size of the plates is of the order of a quarter of a micrometer, the thickness of the plates. So the contribution to strength from that is, is significant, but it's not very large. Instead, the dislocation density makes a large contribution to the strength. And this is the strength from pure iron without any microstructure because that still has a resistance to dislocation motion. And then we have our substitutional elements. So it's possible to look uh, by calculation at the different components of strength and to engineer those according to need. This component of strength, uh, if we reduce the thickness of the plate by a small amount, it increases dramatically and later on I will show you that that can make the biggest contribution to the strength of bainite. <clears throat> this is how the strength of iron varies as a function of temperature. So let's imagine that we are looking at this particular uh, level of strain uh, then it's very very sensitive to temperature as we go down to low temperatures. Okay? And of course, if you vary the strain rate, then the strength increases with strain rate. Okay? So this is a basic feature of body-centered cubic iron that its flow stress, the stress required to move dislocations, is very sensitive to temperature at low temperatures. And this has a very big effect on properties because this is the stress required to move dislocations. And this is the stress required to cleave the crystal. That means to break it without much plastic deformation. Where those two curves cross at this point here is what we call the ductile brittle transition temperature. So below this temperature you have cleavage fracture, brittle fracture. And above this temperature it's easier for the material to flow by plastic deformation. So it is ductile fracture. The cleavage strength is not very sensitive to temperature, but the flow stress is very sensitive, and that is why we get a ductile brittle transition in ferritic iron. If this was austenite, then the flow stress curve would remain below the cleavage strength. So austenite doesn't cleave. It doesn't have a ductile brittle transition temperature. Okay? Uh, this is a, an oversimplified diagram. The cleavage strength is not constant. If you change uh, certain things inside your uh, lattice, you know, if you change the composition, for example, the nickel concentration, then the cleavage strength increases. Okay? And the reason why the flow stress is very sensitive to temperature is that dislocations in ferrite are actually dissociated on a very, very fine scale. They are dissociated in three dimensions, so they require quite a lot of activation in order to move from one position to another. Okay? And the way in which alloying elements influence that dissociation determines the ductile brittle transition temperature. So this is a fundamental feature of body-centered cubic iron that below a certain temperature it prefers to uh, fracture by cleavage rather than by plasticity. And of course what we want is plasticity in order to absorb energy during fracture. Uh, we, many models of strengthening assume that solid solution strengthening is a constant term per unit of concentration. So, for example, 40 megapascals per weight percent. But this is uh, quite old work which clearly shows that solid solution strengthening depends on temperature. So, for example, if you look at, whoops, uh, 
If you look at the solid solution strengthening due to nickel, at high temperatures it's not making much of a contribution. It has the largest contribution near to room temperature. This is in Kelvin here. And at very low temperatures it even causes solid solution softening. Because I explained to you that at low temperatures the flow stress is very sensitive to temperature. So there is a large barrier to dislocation motion. And if you put a solute atom inside the crystal which disturbs the crystal, then it helps the dislocation to surmount a barrier. So at low temperatures, many of these solutes actually cause softening rather than hardening. But you're talking about temperatures well below room temperature. Okay. Sorry? Did somebody ask a question? Okay, okay. So, this is the carbon atom inside the lattice of austenite, and you can see that it's a regular octahedron. Uh, by regular octahedron, I mean that all of these edges are of equal length. So, the expansion caused by carbon is isotropic. Yeah? So carbon in austenite behaves like substitution of solid solution strengthening. It's not a very large effect. It okay? doesn't strengthen austenite very much because a hydrostatic expansion can only interact with the dilatational strain of a dislocation, which is very small. Okay? The major strain due to a dislocation is shear, and the shear can't interact with a volume change. Whereas if you look at ferrite, the carbon atom has different distances here and here. So it's a tetragonal strain. And that tetragonal strain can interact with the shear components of a dislocation. So it's a very powerful hardening mechanism. So it isn't true that carbon always hardens steel very much. It hardens ferrite very much. Now, normal way of looking at grain size strengthening is the whole patch equation here where we plot the strength as a function of 1 over the grain size to the power of a half, 1 over the square root of grain size. And the whole patch equation comes from the propagation of slip between two different grains. So you have slip starting in one grain, it forms a barrier of dislocations at the boundary, and that triggers a dislocation source in an adjacent grain. And that mechanism works when the grain size is reasonably large. But when the grain size becomes very small, there are no dislocation sources present inside the grain. And it's really dislocations in the boundaries which have to move in order to propagate plasticity across grains. And then when we talk about martensite or bainite, the plates are very thin, you know, of the order of a quarter of a micrometer in size. So what's controlling plasticity propagating across grains is not the whole patch mechanism, but dislocations in the last boundaries which have to move across the grain. Okay? And for that, the relationship is not one upon the square root of the grain size, but rather one upon the grain size. Okay? Uh, unfortunately, if you do experimental measurements and you plot the strength either as a function of the grain size to the minus one or minus a half, you still get a straight line because those experiments don't cover a wide enough range. But theoretically, it should be one upon the grain size. So if we reduce the thickness by a factor of two, we should double the strength. Okay. okay. Fine grain size. There's been a lot of research all over the world to try and produce extremely fine grain structures in steel, in many other metallic alloys. And all of that research, I would say, uh, if you talk about going to grain sizes less than one micrometer, has failed. Okay? And it has failed because of this reason. Supposing we reduce the grain size from, say, 10 micrometers to 0 0.27 micrometers, of course we increase the strength. But look at what happens to ductility. The ductility almost vanishes. As soon as you start to deform, you lose, uh, you get plastic instability 
there's, all, there's no uniform strain that you can see in that fine grain structure. And that's because the material loses the capacity for work hardening. If you have a very fine grain size, the dislocations go into the grain boundaries. So the inside of the grain is free of dislocations. So there's no capacity for the material to work harden. And you need work hardening in order to get uniform strain. Okay? So all the work that has been done in producing very fine grain size, either by severe deformation or by very rapid cooling, etc., has failed. It, you do not get ductile materials. Okay? I don't know of a single example where a very fine grain structure, the so called nanostructures, have produced ductile material. Okay? And that is simply because you lose the capacity for work hardening. And I'm going to show you how to recover that capacity for work hardening and actually produce a nanostructured steel later on. So going to a fine grain structure is not always a good thing. You have to not just increase the strength, you must also improve the other properties of the material. And, uh, so, so this is a case for aluminium here. You can see aluminium and similar results for steel. As you go to finer and finer grain sizes, you basically have zero uniform ductility. And that's of course no good in engineering applications. The reason is of course that when I reduce the grain size, the dislocations end up in the boundaries and there's nothing left inside the grains. Yeah? Simple reason, as I reduce the grain size, the amount of volume occupied by the boundaries increases. Yeah? And the boundaries are very good sinks for dislocations or for vacancies, etc. So the grain becomes clean from dislocations. You can, you can see that here. There's nothing inside, inside the grain. So you can't have work hardening. Okay. Now, all of this uh, theory that I've just explained, I've explained for a single phase. That means, you know, you've got a certain dislocation density inside a grain, you've got a certain grain size, and so on. But in steels, we frequently don't have uh, a single phase. We have a mixed microstructure. And the normal way of dealing with a mixed microstructure is to calculate the strength, for example, here of bainite and the strength of martensite, and then add them up with uh, multiplying them by the volume fractions of the phases and simply add them up. Okay, let's see if that is uh, justified. So this is the normal way of dealing with mixed microstructures. So this, for example, is the strength of martensite and the volume fraction of martensite, and simply use an addition rule to work out the overall strength. And these are results published about 20 years ago which show that that is not correct. Okay? Uh, for some reason, you know, if you have a mixture of bainite and martensite, you actually get a higher strength at this fraction of um, bainite. So why is that? Why, why doesn't the strength simply go uniformly from 100% bainite to 100% martensite? What is it that is causing this peak in strength. Now, of course you can do this in two different ways. You can try and understand this in two different ways. One is to create a very complicated finite element model which has the constitutive equations for all the phases and then work out the stress strain behavior. But you can actually do this much more simply without losing any accuracy. And I, I will show you how to do that. Well the first effect is that as soon as you introduce some bainite into the microstructure, the composition of the remaining austenite changes. Okay? And therefore, the strength of the martensite that you form from that austenite will be different. Yeah, you can no longer assume the, that the composition of the austenite is the same as the average composition of your steel. Uh, so if you work out the carbon concentration in the austenite as a function of the volume fraction of austenite, that is the carbon concentration which you must use to calculate the strength of martensite. So the bainite forms, it partitions carbon, and therefore the strength of the martensite actually increases. Okay? And we must take that into account. The second factor is a much more subtle factor, and that has to do with constraint. And I'm going to illustrate that 
by looking at the joining of two bits of material by putting a brazing material. So if you like a bit of glue in between two bits of metal. If you work out the strength of glue, it's very, very small. Okay, so if you make a large sample of glue and you test it, it's basically a polymer. Okay, and it will break very easily. It doesn't have much strength. But even now, you are considering making cars by joining steel using glue. How can you do that if the strength of the glue is very, very small? Well, the answer is that this layer of polymer has to be very, very thin. When it is thin, it is stopped from deforming by the steel which is around it. So that's, that's constrained. If you make your glue thinner, your joint actually becomes stronger. Okay? Because the steel stops that glue from deforming. Okay? And you can see that in this graph over here, that as I increase the thickness of the glue, the strength drops dramatically. Okay, so this is the strength of the glue by itself. It increases here because the surrounding steel stops the glue from deforming. So it's very interesting, you know, if you actually make your layer of glue or brazing material thinner, then your joint becomes stronger. Okay? So when you have a strong material and a weak material and you put them together, the strong material will stop the softer material from deforming. So the yield strength of the softer material increases. At the same time, the yield strength of the harder material decreases. And this is exactly what happens also in dual phase steels, where you have a mixture of ferrite and martensite. The ferrite actually yields at a higher strength than would be the case if it was 100% ferrite. Okay. Now we can use this curve, which comes from brazing experiments. You know, braze is basically a soft material which you put between two bits of steel to make a joint. We can use this curve to actually model bainite. We can say that, look, if my volume fraction is 0.4 of bainite, then the actual strength of bainite will be higher than if it was 100% bainite because of the constraint provided by martensite. Okay? And when we do that, if this is the strength of a 100% bainitic structure, okay, first of all, we will increase the total strength of the microstructure because we are partitioning carbon into the material. Okay? Uh, so the strength of bainite will be higher than that of 100% bainite. And then we have the plastic constraint effect. And you can see that when we do that, we get a peak at a certain volume fraction of bainite. So there are two effects. One is that the strength of martensite itself is not constant because we are putting carbon into the austenite. So here, when we have a large volume fraction of bainite, we expect a very high strength martensite. Okay. So the strength of martensite is not constant. That contributes to the strength of the mixed microstructure. But then we have this plastic constraint which actually increases the strength of bainite. And this is the reason why we get a peak in the strength. And here, here are those same experimental data that I showed you earlier. This is the rule of mixtures, okay, which clearly doesn't reproduce the experimental data. This is allowing for carbon partitioning, and this is allowing for carbon partitioning and the plastic constraint. And you can see that I don't need to use a complicated finite element model. I can just use that master curve for constraint and the partitioning of carbon and the data are reproduced pretty accurately. Okay? So we can't simply use a rule of mixtures when we are dealing with uh, a soft and a hard material together, like a dual phase steel, for example. <coughs> okay, so we go back to this uh, diagram and uh, you know, we've lost the crystal structure of iron and this is the dislocation density, but don't worry. We, we, we still have the basic equation in mind that the strength consists of the strength of pure iron, solid solution strengthening uh, components, the carbon behaves in a special way. We have a grain size dependence, which is one upon the grains, uh, one upon the thickness of the plates, precipitation hardening, and dislocation density contribution. And by analyzing a lot of data in the literature on dislocation densities, 
you can simply take this curve to show how the dislocation density changes with the transformation temperature. So that provides you with information on how to calculate the dislocation density contribution. Now, of course, uh, temperature comes into this as well because when we are dealing with creep-resistant painitic steels, we have to take account of the fact that all the different components change with temperature. And this is a, a calculation of the creep strength of a classic bainitic steel, two and a quarter chrome, one molybdenum, which is usually tempered at about 500 degrees centigrade to produce alloy carbides, you know, molybdenum carbides and chromium carbides and so forth. The size of this chart here, of this circle, is a measure of the total strength. So obviously as I go to 600 degrees centigrade, the total strength decreases because this material is not designed for 600 degrees centigrade. It's designed for about 560 degrees centigrade. So its creep strength drops dramatically as I go to 600 degrees centigrade. But the thing that I wanted to notice is the following, that at 550 degrees centigrade, the major contribution to strength comes from precipitates, molybdenum carbides and chromium carbides. As I go up in temperature, the precipitation hardening component decreases dramatically because of thermal activation. Dislocations can climb over precipitates. And the major contribution to strength really comes from solid solution strengthening. Okay? Because that uh, does, doesn't have any coarsening effects or anything like that. Solid solution strengthening is the most important at very high temperatures. So a great deal of research, including you know, at POSCO special steels, to design creep resistant steels for high temperatures. And the focus there should be on solid solution strengthening because we are going to put these steels into service for something like 25 years. You cannot rely on precipitation hardening. Those precipitates will coarsen and you quickly lose precipitation strengthening. Solid solution strengthening is the way to go for creep resistance at very high temperatures from 600 to 650 degrees centigrade. Now, in this particular case, uh, creep is a very, very difficult and complicated phenomenon. Okay? There are simple equations which tells you how the creep strength will depend on precipitates and so forth. But they are too simple. Those equations are not capable of making predictions about creep life. Okay? What we are using here is neural networks. Okay? Now neural networks are simply very complicated mathematical functions which you can express as a function of hundreds of variables. Yeah. Yes? Uh, we can hear you, uh, so please could you uh, kiss to your microphone if you like. Yes, yes. Uh, I apologize, I will keep my microphone very close. Okay, okay so uh, I was talking about creep rupture strength. And creep rupture strength is very complicated. You know, it depends on so many variables that all the simple metallurgical theories that have been developed for creep um, simply cannot reproduce the results. Okay, so they cannot make predictions. If you ask me that what happens if I add one weight percent of molybdenum to this steel, how will the creep rupture strength increase? You cannot answer that question using all the creep theory that has been researched on for more than 60 years. So what we are doing here is using neural network models to capture the behavior of creep resistant steels. And these graphs that you see on the screen are actually produced using neural network models where we can deconvolute the components of the creep strength of complicated steels. So very large number of variables involved in determining creep properties. And using this method, we can even say that look, this much of the strength comes from M23C6 and M6C carbides, from niobium nitride, vanadium nitride, and from solid solution strengthening and so forth. So even though we don't have the fundamental theory for creep, which is capable of predicting the creep strength, there are other methods we can use to 
study the creep strength of complicated steels and to make predictions. Okay, that's the main thing. It's all very well doing some fundamental studies on how dislocations will climb over precipitates and so on, but if they cannot make a prediction for complicated steels, then they are of little use in industry. These models can replace that problem by making a function of many, many variables, hundreds of variables. Okay, so there's a lot of work going on in GIFT, for example, to model the mechanical properties of steels using neural network methods. Okay, let's now uh, move on to toughness because anybody can produce a very strong steel. The difficult thing is to produce a steel which is strong and which is also tough. And toughness is the ability of a material to absorb energy before fracture. Okay, it's a very simple uh, device and we measure it in several different ways. The most common is the Charpy test. Okay, the Charpy test, you make a specimen, you hit it uh, very fast and you measure the absorbed energy. And the Charpy test is a very, very good quality control experiment. You cannot use that number to design a steel structure, but it's a very good quality control test. Uh, this is a, a, a more fundamental material property. It's a K1C or fracture toughness test. The number that you get from a K1C test you can actually use to design a structure and say look this structure will be safe if the crack or defect is less than a certain size. It will not fracture by rapid fracture. Okay? So there are many different kinds of tests and all of them are important. This one tells you immediately if something has gone wrong in your seal production this one gives you a number which you can use to design a ship or an uh, offshore structure or whatever. Okay. Now, uh, our focus is on bainitic steels and I explained to you the mechanism of transformation yesterday. And it basically happens in two stages that you have diffusionless growth, the carbon then partitions into austenite and then we have precipitation of cementite. And this, this part is very bad for toughness. Okay, because we are not tempering the material deliberately. The cementite is forming during the course of the reaction and it's coarse particles. Right? So when we go into high strength steels, the cementite is actually a bad phase to have there. It is a brittle phase with a very complicated crystal structure and this is the main reason why bainitic steels have not competed against quenched and tempered martensitic steels for many, many years. Okay. Now, of course, we can get rid of this problem. All we have to do is add something like silicon or aluminum in about one weight percent, and that prevents the precipitation of cementite. And the way in which silicon or aluminum prevents the precipitation of cementite is that they do not dissolve in the cementite lattice. Okay. Silicon and aluminum prefer not to be inside cementite. But remember that bainite and martensite form at a low temperature. So diffusion of silicon and aluminum is not possible at those temperatures. So when cementite precipitates, it's forced to accept the silicon. Okay? So it is forced into the cementite structure. And when you force it into the structure of cementite, the phase diagram changes completely. So for example here, uh, this is our composition of the alloy and this is the austenite plus cementite phase field. So under equilibrium conditions, when the silicon partitions away from the cementite, it doesn't enter the cementite, you will get precipitation of cementite because we are in the two phase field here. As soon as I force the silicon to enter the cementite, the alloy cannot precipitate cementite. It lies in the 100% austenite phase field. So if you do not allow the silicon to partition, then the cementite will not form because it hates silicon so much. Okay? So the mechanism by which silicon and aluminium prevent the precipitation of cementite is simple. If, if you form the cementite at a low temperature, it is forced to accept the silicon, which it does not like, and therefore it will prefer not to form. Okay? So this method of preventing cementite formation has been known for more than a hundred years. For, for example, if we add silicon to cast iron, 
we get gray cast iron instead of white cast iron. The white cast iron is uh, cementite, whereas the gray cast iron forms graphite instead of cementite. And you can even do calculations on um, the retardation of cementite by silicon. So here, for example, we have only half a weight percent silicon. And you can see that the kinetics of precipitation from austenite are much more rapid than when I increase the silicon concentration to one and a half weight percent. And furthermore, I've actually had a decrease in the possible fraction of cementite that can form. So we influence both the thermodynamics and the kinetics of precipitation by adding things like silicon. So let's assume that we don't need to worry about silicon and we produce this beautiful microstructure of bainite where we have avoided cementite and instead of cementite we have carbon enriched films of austenite. Okay? So these these regions here are austenitic films which are rich in carbon. We not only have this FCC phase between the plates of bainite and remember I told you austenite does not have a ductile brittle transition so this is good for toughness. Yeah? We not only have those films but we have a very very fine grain size. This is of the order of a quarter of a micrometer and there is no thermomechanical processing which can produce a grain size of a quarter of a micrometer. Okay? Here we produce it naturally by phase transformation. So it, this looks like it's a wonderful structure where we have very fine grain size, we have a nice austenite dispersed between the plates that should give us a good composite toughness and we are only using the carbon to stabilize the austenite. There's no expensive alloying element. So let's look at the toughness of this wonderful microstructure. Well, when you measure the toughness, it's very bad. Okay? There's something really wrong. You know, you can look at the impact transition temperature there is more than uh, is of the order of 100 degrees centigrade. So we have this beautiful microstructure which should have good toughness, but it's very bad. Why is that? Well, if you look at the optical microstructure, then in addition to those very fine films of austenite between the plates, we have these large regions here of austenite, which are rich in carbon. And as soon as you apply a stress, they transform into high carbon martensite, untempered high carbon martensite, which is very brittle. So you can imagine that these regions of austenite are like hard inclusions in your microstructure which are something like 50 micrometers in size. So your toughness is very bad. Okay? Now, how can we get rid of these large regions of austenite? Well, if we allow more bainite to form, then you can get rid of those regions, right? But there's a problem. And that problem is the T0 curve that I explained to you yesterday. That T0 curve stops the reaction from going further. So here, even if I hold this material in the bainite transformation range for several years, this will not change. Because that T0 curve we discussed yesterday stops more bainite from forming. Okay? Uh, this is the curve that I explained to you yesterday. Once the austenite reaches this carbon concentration, it is impossible for it to transform into bainite. Yeah? Thermodynamic, impossible to transform into more bainite. So we have a big problem that we want to get rid of these large islands of austenite, but thermodynamics tells us you cannot do that. Okay. So, um, this is our T0 curve here. This is the average composition of our steel okay, uh, in terms of carbon. And the volume fraction of bainite that we can get is given by this distance divided by this distance because you can take the carbon concentration of ferrite to be zero. Okay? Solubility of carbon in ferrite is almost zero. So using that equation, 
Can anybody tell me how I can increase the volume fraction of bainite? Because that's what we need to do. So there are three ways of doing it. So be brave and tell me how we can increase the volume fraction of bainite. Yeah. Very good. So one way is very clear that if I decrease the carbon concentration of my alloy, okay, then the lever rule tells me that I will get more bainitic ferrite. And I will not lose strength because I'm actually producing more bainite, which is the fine structure. Okay? Any other methods? There are two sorry? Decrease the temperature because as I go down in temperature, the T0 concentration here increases. But of course, I cannot go below the Martin size start temperature. Okay? And the third way. Change the position of T0. Yeah. So this T0 curve here depends on the concentrations of other elements in our material. For example, manganese, nickel, and so forth. And we can change its position by altering those compositions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Uh, this alloy here, which has very poor toughness, and I'm making two new alloys. One in which I change the substitution of solute to move the T0 curve to higher carbon concentrations. Okay? And the second one in which I reduce the carbon concentration by a factor of two without losing any strength. And let's see how the toughness changes. So here are the two different alloys. Here we've cut down the carbon concentration by a factor of two without losing strength. And in this case, we have shifted the T0 curve to larger carbon concentrations. And here are the microstructures of those two new steels, very nice microstructures with vanitic ferrite and films of austenite. And we've lost the large islands of austenite. And just by that very simple analysis, the impact transition curves have been shifted by 200 degrees centigrade to lower temperatures. Okay? So you can see the blue and the red curves on there have an impact transition temperature which is much lower than the original alloy. So no loss of strength, but a dramatic improvement in toughness simply by eliminating these large islands of austenite. Okay? So the thermodynamics that we learned yesterday actually predicted that this should happen. Okay? And that curve is very, very important in the design of carbide-free bainitic steels. And you can calculate that very easily simply by downloading a free computer program on the website that I gave you yesterday as a function of many elements, you know, carbon, manganese, silicon, nickel, molybdenum, chrome, vanadium, and so forth. Uh, we use this concept to design a completely novel microstructure for railway steels. Yesterday I explained to you that the toughness of perlite doesn't improve when you make the distance between cementite and ferrite smaller. The strength improves and the wear resistance improves, but the toughness doesn't because the crystallographic size of perlite is the colony size. Right? Uh, so we have made many rail steels which are harder and are wear resistant but they are not tough. Okay? Here we have produced rail steel which is completely free of carbides based on the bainitic microstructure of bainitic ferrite plates and carbon enriched retained austenite. And if you look at the rolling contact fatigue resistance it is very very high compared with a martensitic or perlitic rail steel and here you have the wear rate both on the wheel and on the rail and you can see this new bainitic structure, carbide free bainitic structure has much better wear resistance on both the rail and the wheel because it doesn't produce debris this, uh, you know, uh, there are no brittle carbides so it deforms rather than producing lots of fragments abrasive fragments and one problem is that when we made these deals, the small rails were fine, but the large rails turned out to have very poor fracture toughness. Okay? Now remember I said to you yesterday that 
With displacive transformations, plates cannot cross austenite grain boundaries. Okay? So, they are limited to the same austenite grain in contrast to diffusional transformations where ferrite can grow across grain boundaries and destroy the prior austenite grains. Yeah? With displacive transformations, you are left with prior austenite grain boundaries where impurities segregate. And of course, that's also true of bainite. So what happened was, with the larger rails, we had intergranular failure, because a larger rail cools slowly. And you cannot say to the steel maker that, look, you have to reduce the phosphorus concentration to zero. That's not possible in practice. So what do you do? Supposing you add a quarter weight percent of molybdenum, and again, this is a very well-known, well-established in the literature, uh, then it will stop the phosphorus from having an embrittling effect by stopping it from diffusing to the austenite grain boundaries. So all you have to do is add a quarter weight percent of molybdenum to the alloy, uh, or, or less than a quarter in this case, and the problem disappears. Okay? You, you can get rid of the problem of phosphorus embrittlement. And these are actual Bainitic rail steels in service in three countries now. And of course, after they have been in service for many, many years, they will be marketed for other applications. And all of this comes from the T0 concept, improving the toughness. Okay. Now, the next question to ask is, how big is a big austenite island? Yeah? Should it be, uh, you know, is, does the problem happen when we have 50 micrometer size austenite islands, or does the problem happen when we have 10 micrometer austenite grain size, or austenite islands? How coarse is a coarse island? Yes, so if I go back to the optical micrograph that I showed you. You know, we've got about 50 micrometer size austenite islands. Uh, how much do I have to reduce those islands in order to avoid the problem of high carbon martensite cracking. Right, this is, this is where we can use some theory which comes from composites, from brittle fiber composites. So for example, glass fiber inside a polymer matrix. Okay? We make long fibers of glass inside polymer. When we pull the composite, the glass fiber will crack because it's brittle. Okay? And the distribution of stress on that glass fiber is like this. The ends experience less stress than the middle because you have to transfer the stress from the polymer to the glass through the interface. Okay? And here there is a weaker transfer, so you have to build up the stress, a uniform stress in the middle and less stress at the ends. Okay? So when you pull it, it will break into two bits and the stress distribution inside the glass changes like this. And you get to a point <coughs> where after you apply the stress, these fibers will not break because the peak value of stress reached inside the fiber is now less than the fracture stress. So if you make your glass fiber smaller than a certain size, which depends on the characteristics of the interface between the polymer and glass, then it will not break when you pull it. Of course, it doesn't make your composite strong, because you need the fibers to carry the load. Yeah? But if they are smaller than a certain size, they will not break, because you cannot transfer stress from the polymer to the glass fiber. Okay? So what we've got to do is we've got to make the islands of austenite smaller than a certain size so that when martensite forms in there, you don't transfer too much stress onto the martensite. And I can show you exactly the same sort of feature as glass fiber composites, where you can see the plate of martensite here has cracked periodically. So if I make my martensite smaller than this size, then it will not crack. Okay, this is a, just an unetched sample to show you the periodic cracking of the plate of martensite. So what I've got to do is I've got to make the islands of austenite small enough so that when the martensite comes under stress, it does not crack. 
Okay? So there's not a single answer. It depends on how strong your steel is. Okay? If it is not a very strong steel, then it's difficult to transfer stress onto the martin side and there's not a problem. Like for example the trip assisted steels that you have in cars. Those are, those are strong but not very strong in the context of strong steels. But if you're making something which is two and a half gigapascals strong, then you've got to make your islands of austenite much, much smaller. Okay, let's now look at ductility, which is another important uh, engineering uh, characteristic. So when we do a tensile test uh, and we want elongation, what determines the ductility of these bainitic microstructures, carbide-free bainitic microstructures? Well, supposing we have three different kinds of uh, bainitic steels. In one case, we have 17% of retained austenite, 21% and 37%. So this is just a mixture of bainitic ferrite and austenite. Uh, we see that the elongation is different. Okay, so here we have about 7%, here we have 27% of elongation. Now, why, why is that? Okay. <coughs> Well, th this is just to illustrate again. Uh, this is a true stress strain and engineering stress strain. And in this particular case, I have 7% of ductility. Uh, and in this case, I have 27%. So I'd like to know why I have these big variations in ductility. Well, of course, uh, when we pull these steels, the austenite is undergoing phase transformation stress and strain induced transformation to martensite and that's the reason why these steels are good the trip effect gives you a higher toughness it cancels out stress concentrations so let's take three steels all of them with the same microstructure of bainitic ferrite and austenite and starting austenite contents are given by these blue dots as I pull them the austenite will start to decompose to martensite in, in this way. These are calculated curves. Okay? So I expect the austenite to transform into martensite as I pull them by stress or strain induced transformation. And what I'm going to do is on these curves I will plot the fracture strain okay, for each of these samples. So here is the, the red points are the points where the tensile specimen broke. And what I claim is that that's approximately when the austenite content reached 10% in the microstructure. So what I want to say is that there is this magic number of 10% of austenite at which the specimen breaks. Now what is magic about this 10% of austenite? Just to show you that uh, these, are, these are actually calculated curves, but we did some measurements of a tensile test in a in an experiment where we monitor the fraction of austenite as it transforms using neutron diffraction. Okay? And the same result comes out that you get fracture when you reach about 10% of austenite remaining in the microstructure. Now, in this diagram, the blue part represents the austenite. And the volume fraction of austenite is such that I have a continuous path through the austenite here. So I can draw a line continuously from one end to the other end of this microstructure only going through austenite. Okay? So we say that this microstructure has percolation. That means I can go all the way through the microstructure through just the austenite. Okay? So it's above a certain threshold which allows me to do that. So it's above the percolation threshold. This microstructure, on the other hand, is below the percolation threshold and I cannot draw a continuous line through the austenite. Okay? And what I claim is that once we go below the percolation <coughs> threshold, the sample breaks because we've got these regions of martensite which are formed okay, in, in, in what used to be austenite. And we can no longer get the ductility from the austenite and the sample then breaks. Now to prove that, uh, we used percolation theory, which is already in the literature. You can see this is a paper from 1995 where we are looking at uh, ellipsoids 
to represent the films of austenite. Okay? Uh, and this is just the aspect ratio of those ellipsoids. And you can work out from this at what fraction we will lose continuity in the austenite. Uh, so this is a plot of the aspect ratio of the films of austenite and this is one divided by the volume fraction of the austenite and you can see that for typical aspect ratios we expect to lose percolation in the austenite when the volume fraction reaches about 10 percent okay now here i'm talking about microstructures which are completely bainitic ferrite and austenite of course, the normal trip assisted steels that go into your cars also have allotriomorphic ferrite, large quantity of allotriomorphic ferrite. So you have to focus on the region of the microstructure, which is just austenite and bainitic ferrite. Once you get below a certain fraction of austenite, you will no longer have continuity in the austenite, and that seems to be the point at which we lose ductility. So if you want to get a greater strain, we have to increase the fraction of austenite or increase the stability of the austenite so that uh, it reaches 10% after much more strain. Okay, so that's a good point to stop now.